today, before we get started, I'd like to uh, take a minute to uh, eulogize or memorialize uh, a long-standing friend of mine who literally died like, oh, two minutes ago. I'd like to mourn the six foot long red charging cable I've used for my phone for perhaps, oh gosh, maybe I've, it's the lightning plug. So I've used it for three phones now. I've used it forever. And it finally, after dropping it, kicking it, throwing it places, leaving it in backpacks and suitcases, having cats chew on it. Um, losing it for a while, having it run over by, by somebody in an argument with me, uh, it finally uh, shuffled off its lightning cable charging coil. And uh, it, it sucks because I'm trying to charge my phone because I, I need it for a client after the chat today. And I had to dig out and, and open up a pack of brand new cords. And I, I just, it doesn't feel the same. I know that sounds stupid, but I'm somebody who gets very attached to routine and very attached to like things. So when, um, when stuff finally goes and, uh, it kind of catches me off guard, it, it throws me for a hot minute. So I'd like to take this time to, to say, you know, goodbye, red charging cable. You, you did far more than I ever expected for, far longer than I could ever ask. I'll miss you, buddy. Anyway, moving on past that now. Uh, shall we begin? We good to go? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, guys, gals, non-binary pals, friends, writers, makers, doers, crafters, dancers, people who actually answer their DMs. Anybody who can appreciate just a genuinely positive message, uh, people who appreciate puns, anybody who thinks puns will make your, make your eyes roll, anybody who um, doesn't really give a shit about the let's skip a prologue, let's not skip a prologue discourse, people who um, just generally find tremendous strength just to survive the day, anybody who's had a pretzel in the last 24 hours, root beer enthusiasts, dancers, photographers, photograph subjects, anybody who's ever, ever looked at a pair of shoes online and wondered why the hell shoes are so expensive, and most importantly, the comrades. This is the writer's chat for February the, I want to make sure I get the date right, February the 20th, and I, through no fault of my own, continue to be John, the guy who's going to help you write better. And if this is the first time you're checking this out or hearing this, this is the writer's chat where across all corners of social media and through all different kinds of communities and people, I have collected 13, a baker's dozen worth of questions about writing, editing, marketing, publishing, just generally being a person who makes books and tells stories, uh, along with the questions from those people here in chat. Hello, chat. It's good to see you. I hope you are doing well. And I'm hoping I can bring some A's to these Q's and help people get some tools in their toolboxes so that they can they can write the stories and tell the stories and do what they want with the stories as they like. How are you doing? You good? You've had some water today? Staying warm? Doing your best to get through a Tuesday that kind of feels a little like a second Monday? You doing okay? We ready to go? Shall we? Let's do it. Question number one. What's the easiest way to know when a chapter should be done? Okay. The easiest way to know a chapter is over is when all the stuff that you want to say at that moment is done. Chapters contain some number of scenes. When, when you're done telling those scenes, chapter's done. Maybe that's just one scene. Maybe that's two scenes doesn't really matter. Chapters can be any size. But when you do all the things you want to do and you're at a good natural breaking point, chapters are done. There isn't a measure 
or there isn't like a rule that says, ah, you've written five pages, make a new chapter. It, it's not like, it, it doesn't do that. That's not a thing. No one, no one cares. That uniformity you're thinking of when you think about chapters is an editorial decision that comes way later in the publication process. It doesn't do you any good from a writing perspective to try and enforce that rigidity now when most of the time we're just trying to get the story out of our heads and onto the page in the first place. Chapters are done when all the stuff of that moment is done. Maybe that's a scene. Maybe that's a word. Maybe that's five paragraphs and some dialogue. Maybe that's five scenes. Maybe that's the main battle of the war. Who knows? It, it doesn't. It doesn't really have a set size. Chapters can be any size. Chapters can be different sizes from each other. But they're all going to be done when you've said everything for the moment you want to say and it's time to move forward for whatever reason, whether that's a, a narrative reason or a structural reason or you've you know set up a cliffhanger so it's time to pay it off or whatever. It's, it's just time to move forward to the next thing of the story. Great first question. On we go to question two. Should I be growing my social media, my social media audience consistently, meaning a certain number of people per day, or should I plan for it to grow only when I make announcements? When I saw this question, my first thought was of succulents. You know, those tiny little plants people put on like their desks and in their cubicles and everything, or they put on those ledges in their office to bring a little bit of green to a drab room. And there's always those questions of like, how much do I water it? What do I do if there are bugs on it? You know, should I rotate them? Should I turn them? What, you know, should I fertilize them in some way? And there's all these like prep questions and creative questions around growing these little potted plants in your office. When the actual act of growth is something the plant does on its own. And I think that idea carries over really nicely when we're talking about social media size. Because a lot of that social media growth is not controlled by you. That's from other people checking you out, seeing what you're about, seeing you promote it seeing what you say and how frequently you use it, and then seeing and asking themselves, do I want to see this more often? Do I want to be a part of this? And they make that choice. You can plan all you want to go every, every day. I will, I will, I will post, I will write so that four people join. Like you can set those goals, but it doesn't happen that way. Good social media growth is organic. And it happens because you're using the platform regularly, because you're doing more than just, you know, throwing out, hey, buy my book, here's the link. Or, hey, here's my stupid contribution to a vapid question. Or, you know, something like, oh, there's a sale, here you go. It's, it's about being a person and having other humans engage with you through the medium of this platform. The platform is a vehicle to connect your conversation. And growth people following you, your numbers going up, people joining, subscribing, clicking the bell, doing whatever they do on social media for whatever platform is a choice they make because the value, the, the improvement you bring them, the value you give them, what you are saying resonates with them, helps them, informs them, entertains them, engages with them in such a way that they would like to get more of it. And one of the best ways to get more of it is to engage with you more frequently. So they like follow, subscribe, click the bell, et cetera, et cetera. Trying to force it is sort of like going and looking at your plant and going, okay, grow, grow an inch, grow an inch, damn it. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm definitely somebody who will err on the side of let's have soothing vibes around our plants and let's put on some chill music and just be nice in the office. You can't, you can't force growth. You can't, no matter what somebody says, no matter what somebody sells you as a course or suggests. You, you can't force that growth. So if you want to set a number, don't be surprised if you get disappointed by this effort, not because you're a bad person, not because everything's, you know, sucks. It's just that it, it can't always be guaranteed or arranged. Also, likewise, the flip side of this, you can't always guarantee that when you make an announcement that you're going to get a response because social media is huge 
Algorithms are stupid, but they're everywhere. And it becomes really difficult to get a handle on what exactly makes it work. Because for instance, today I can post a promo and link announcing the chat today. And sometimes I'll do it and I'll get a handful of people liking, retweeting, sharing, saying they're going to be here. Sometimes I get nothing. Sometimes I get one or two. I, I can't plan for an audience to show up. I can say somebody's going to show up at some point somewhere. Somebody will at the very least listen to this as a podcast because it'll go out on the podcast feed as soon as I'm done recording. But I can't guarantee the specific number of people, no matter how much I want to, as badly as I want to like look at the little number on my screen and one day have it be double digits or something. I can't like insist, God damn it. You motherfuckers do something. Be, be double digits. I, I can't. And if I sit here and start chasing it, well, what would I have to do in order to get 10 people? What would I like? If I start doing that, I'm just going to spiral myself into some kind of anxiety that I, it's not going to help me answer questions. It's not going to put me in a good mood and it, it's just going to bum me out. So my advice to you is think about your plants. You can't force them to grow, but you can do a hell of a lot to encourage them to grow. Give them regular attention, give them water, give them access to sunlight and whatever else they need. Take good care of them and then just sort of let them do their plant thing. I think that's a really strong advice for social media growth. On we go to question three. Question three. How much editing should I do myself before hiring an editor? Um, yes, you should do some. Well, let's start there. So first of all, before let's, let's roll back like a half step. If you're self publishing your book, you need an editor period. I'm not going to debate or argue with you on this point. It's only going to improve your book. Now, why that is very simple. One, uh, you need somebody who isn't you helping improve your work because you wrote it. You're a little face blind, a little bit eye blind to some of those mistakes you're making. And, and that's okay. Get, you know, get some help, get a trained pro, have somebody come in and help improve your thing. It's only going to do you a better job down the road when you go produce it and people look at it and go, oh, this is a well-polished thing. It's, you know, it's not making simple errors. It makes sense. It's easy to read. It's a pleasure to read. I will keep buying books from this person because I expect this level of production. It's only going to help you. That said, there is some degree of editing that you can do yourself. Part of this sounds really simple, but this is a really good question that has some part of a simple answer. Step number one, check your spelling, check your spelling, make sure your names are consistent. If you've been calling somebody Rourke or Susan the entire time, Make sure Rourke is always Rourke and make sure Susan's always Susan. If you've been, you know, identifying or describing somebody in a certain way every time or pretty regularly, hair color, height, something like that, a really easy visual thing that you want to make sure the reader understands or pictures in their head, make sure they're those physical descriptors is as much as every time you bring them up. So if, if a person is blonde or whatever, then they're blonde the whole time. Don't, don't sleep on those small details, even though they seem quick and hasty and, and relatively unimportant compared to whatever else is going on in the story. Those small little details that you can manage make a huge difference. One other thing, let me give you a couple things, actually. Another thing you can look for in dialogue Make sure you have the appropriate number of quotation marks. There are times where you're going to have multiple paragraphs in dialogue and they don't always need quotations at the end of everything because you're chaining paragraphs together. But, you know, make sure at least your dialogue has a starting quotation mark. Make sure, you know, that your, your ending dialogue has an ending quotation mark. Make sure that, you know, sentences are punctuated. If you're using periods, commas, exclamation points like that, make sure those are in there. Simple, easy things. It's a little tedious. Absolutely. It's a little tedious, but you taking care of that gives the editor, whether that's a developmental editor or a copy editor or somebody in between that 
that takes one thing off their plate that they have to worry about. They can focus on what's important for doing their job. If you want a, a non-writing version of this, it's sort of like, you know, let's say your sink is is running and your, your toilet is running or your sink is dripping in your bathroom. Cleaning up your bathroom so that when the plumber comes in, they can array out their tools and take things apart is just, other than it being a courtesy, it's going to help them do their job better. So make sure just like you would clean the bathroom floor a little bit so that they have room to, you know, lay out all the parts and pieces, you go through and do a very straightforward copy edit kind of a thing. You know, F7 in, in Word isn't the only thing that editors do, but by you doing that, it makes life a lot easier down the road. Small, simple edits go a long way. The other thing you might want to take a look at, just so that we're clear, is that if you've written any notes, like, Put a, put a scene in here where, you know, where they go to the horse race or something and you're working, you know, your editor isn't being brought on to help you write or develop that scene. Like you're not going to a writing coach or something. If you're going to a copy editor who's going to polish this thing to send it out the door, make sure you clean up those notes. Holy shit, I don't know what the fuck's going to happen here. Don't leave that in your book because you wouldn't want the reader to see that you don't know what you're doing. Clean up your notes. Handle some basic grammar. That's that's about it. Then trust the editor, hopefully, to do the best job they can. Simple, straightforward, good relationship building, good professionalism. I hope that helps. People in chat, hello, how are you? Do you have any questions? I'm, hey, it's good to see you too. I'm doing well. Thank you. Um, it's a good day. It's a good day. I'm, 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 there's sun streaming in the office. I'm content. I've eaten. I'm doing okay. Thank you for asking. I hope you're doing well too. Today's afternoon midday tea is surprisingly orange. Oh, you want a cup date? Yeah, of course you can get a cup date. Today's tea is surprisingly orangey. I wasn't expecting like citrus. It's um, where's the where's the little bag I got it from? I it, it's it's from a friend. It's this sort of floral herbal tea. Um, it's it's from the U.S. It's local, and it is it's good. It is surprisingly orangey. Um, it would go really really well, honestly, with like a cookie like a, like a chocolate cookie or a shortbread or something. It's a, it's a nice tea. It's better cold than hot because I've got it over ice now. It's, it's very satisfying. Um, it's just not what I was expecting. I was expecting something more floral, more flowery, but, um, it's nice. I'm, I'm quite happy. Uh, this is only cup number one of tea. I've been killing a ton of water today. Um, it just shook out that way. So, yeah, I'm doing good. Thank you for asking for the cup date. Um, if you're, if honestly, if you want like an actual cup date, uh, I'm currently rocking a British pint glass because that's what I reached for out of the cabinet. Um, I don't have many of them left. They have, they have all been poached by various people who used to come to the house ages ago or uh, my wet fingers in washing them would drop them. So I tend to treasure the ones I have left. And this is one of the survivors. It's, it's been a good day overall. Questions or shall we continue? There's some good questions coming. Some truly like, wow, nobody's asked this question before kind of questions. On we go. On we go. Like this one. Question number four is a question nobody's asked me before. I actually dug all the way back through and looked this morning. Question number four. What's the best way to approach magic as a fundamental force in a story akin to gravity or electromagnetism? Oof. Okay, here we go. Strap in. Here's the answer. 
when magic is a fundamental force, you have two factors to consider. One, there's going to be some degree of the story population that takes it for granted. That's a biggie. Like you and I sitting here, how often do we stop and think, really think about gravity? We just assume gravity's working. But how often do we really think about how gravity gravitates? How does gravity do its job? Or magnets, how do they work? Do we really stop and think about, you know, polarity and atoms and how they move and organize? No, we just assume that when we take the magnet and stick it on the fridge, the thing's going to stick on the fridge. Or that gravity is here and we're just going to have gravity. When magic is fundamental like that, there's going to be some degree at all levels of people who take it for granted. Now, if you're doing a thing where one of the dials you're modulating in story, one of the things you're affecting is to suddenly make it uh, not a consistent fundamental force, like all of a sudden we have a story element where we can turn gravity off, then yes, that oddity is going to be proportional to the amount of people who take it for granted. The, the usual go-to here in science fiction is time travel. People assume time moves linearly and actions behave linearly. And then all of a sudden when our story doesn't do that, um, we have a variety of experiences and responses, anything from like back to the future to tenant, where we have to sort of juggle these ideas and reconciliations of reality and understanding and progress and things. So there's, there has to be some level of gr taken for grantedness uh, to make sure that everybody knows that, yeah, it's magic, magic. It's just here like gravity. It's like turning on the light switch magic. It loses some of the specialness that way, because again, we're taking it for granted. So you have to find instead of the existence of it being special, like, Oh, we have gravity. We have magic turn it into its operation or its utility to make it special. Like, yeah, we have gravity, but now we also have like cyclotrons and, and hadron colliders that, that affect gravity, or we have the vomit comet, a plane that, you know, operates independent of gravity at time, or we're, we're looking to develop technology that plays around with our fundamental understanding of things. Beyond that, once we're willing to say, okay, the big thing to consider is that people take it for granted. The other thing to think about here is if we take it for granted, what special thing are you going to call attention to instead? Because in a lot of fantasy stories and science fiction stories, magic is this rare thing, right? Like, like everybody might be a little bit of a wizard, but like the big deal wizards are few and far between. Or magic is special because, holy shit, that guy's making a fireball. And when, when we can all do that, there has to be something you're drawing attention to. Otherwise, you are turning magic into something about as functional or useful as a person going across a room or a person sitting in a chair or somebody blinking and breathing. Be very careful when we are treating something fundamental where most of the population is going to take it for granted, but you're still trying to call it out as special. It's a tricky line that's going to come down to the sort of story you're telling and the specifics of how you write it. But by playing off the idea of take it for granted versus not take it for granted or take it for granted versus give it some deep thought, you're going to get an approach to magic that feels special, but not in a, Hey, look, it's lightning. Yeah, we can all do lightning, Larry. You want to find a view and take on something people take for granted that allows you to have it stand out in the story because otherwise it's, it's a thing that's just there and it's not benefiting the world building, benefiting your plot, creating conflict, allowing for dynamic character growth. And it's just kind of there. It's sort of like the grass is, you know, grass is green and trees are trees. So what we want to get away from that. So what kind of answer? So play around with expectation play around with take it for grantedness and play around with outcome and opportunity. How does it work? When doesn't it work? What are the rules people sort of accept with it? And how do we use it to our regular daily take it for granted advantage? Start there and see what you can do with magic within the story. 
What an amazing narrative question. Love that so much. On we go to question five. I understand that self-publishing means I don't need to query, but aren't I settling if I self-publish? Okay, there's a lot we have to unpack here. Many pieces of luggage now need opening. Self-publishing, yes, means you don't have to query, but it also means other things that are worth talking about, like you have to be the publisher of your book. You have to, like, you know, handle yourself and your work as though it were a separate publisher who you were traditionally publishing with. Yeah, you've, you've skipped the query stage, but you still now got the afford a book cover, do the marketing, get an editor, you know, roll the book into production stages that are far more significant than, you know, needing to query or not query. Don't get into self-publishing just because you don't want to query. It's a whole kettle of fish that is worth talking about. And I believe honestly worth doing, but do it for the right reasons. Do it because self-publishing is going to better allow you not only control over your story, but the ability to frame your story, shape your story, market your story and distribute your story in a way that is more in line with what you're trying to say. Now, Let's hit the back half of this question. Aren't I settling if I self-publish? And I'd like you to listen to me very, very here. I'm going to move closer to the microphone so that you can most definitely hear me when I say this. If you think self-publishing is settling, I'd like you to stop writing. I'd like you to save us all a great deal of frustration and stress and go find something else to fucking do. I don't know. Maybe... Build some birdhouses, maybe like uh, mow some lawns, maybe touch some grass, as the kids say. I don't fucking know. Do something else. Because if you're going to perpetuate this frankly terrible idea that there's a good kind of publishing and then everything else is beneath it or subordinate to it, uh, you're missing the fucking point. You're not even missing the point. You're missing the boat and the dock and the, and the continent that the boat is near. Like you've missed so many things. Settling doesn't, no one gives a shit about settling. That's a really privileged and, and empty idea. It's not going to help you. Self-publishing is just as much a valid form of publishing as traditional publishing, except instead of traditional publishing where some big nameless, you know, tuck your shirt in, shitty corporation is eating your cost, you're eating your cost because you're doing the work because that's what self-publishing is. If you think all that work now being paid for by you instead of somebody else is settling, seriously, that's why we want you to do something other than writing. It's not settling. It's, it requires more activity. It's busier. It's often harder. It requires more time, more focus, more discipline, more care. And if you're not willing to put that in because you see it, oh, this is settling and that's ideal, go fuck yourself and go do something else. Yes, you, you've skipped the querying because rejecting, you know, getting rejected sucks. It does suck. But if you don't like getting rejected, there are many things you can do, including but not limited to writing a better query letter. Don't immediately go, ah, oh, well, how do I just stop querying? Self-publishing can do that, but that means you also sign up for a load of other problems and a load of other challenges. And I, I think a lot of people are unwilling to deal with that, look at that, or accept that because they're too busy trying to get out of this one momentary point of frustration they're experiencing with rejection. So no, you're not settling. It, it just means you're going to take on all the activities and all the actions and expenses and time that a publisher would take. You're going to handle that yourself. It's now, do I think that's the better way to go? Yes. Why? Corporations are terrible. Algorithms are a nightmare. None of that needs to be the way we continue to make books anymore. I think it'll be better for everybody. I think it requires, you know, a greater hand in your art at all stages. I think that makes it worth it. But it's not settling. Go touch some grass, man. It's not settling. Over here in chat, the idea of Larry the Wizard getting thrown in a locker because everyone can shoot lightning makes me smile. Yeah, that's really fair. 
That's real. Yeah, just shove Larry the wizard in as many lockers as is humanly. Just, just right in there, Larry. Just, just get in there. Totally. Shove, shove more wizards. Let's just all shove wizards today. I'm gonna go to question six. Question six. I wrote and published a few books years ago. Well, that's lovely. I would. I I missed a verb when I was writing this. I would like to be judged by my more recent work. What do I do? It's a great question. Uh, one of the easiest things to do is make sure that your older books are no longer available on the platforms or spaces where you're selling your more recent work. Now, the downside of that is um, you, you also can't simultaneously benefit from their praise. Once you pull them, you don't get to have it both ways. Oh, I used to get a million, you know, I used to get plenty of four star reviews and I had an audience, but you can't buy those books anymore. Uh, you you got to take the good with the bad here. Either leave those old books up and let them be evidence of how things were, knowing that your new books are better and we're going to put the focus on those new books. We're going to talk about them more. We're going to market them more aggressively. Maybe correctly might be a better way of saying it if you had no idea what you were doing years ago. You know, it's, it's a decision to make about whether or not you want I'm loath to call it an evidence trail, but if you want to be measured by what you've, what you've done currently, instead of what you've done before, do your best to get what you've done before out of the way. Do I think you should? No. I think, yeah, your old stuff is out there. It is findable. The internet is forever to some degree. So yeah, you can, you can just leave it out there and yeah, you'd love to be judged by your more recent stuff and you hope that the body of work recently stands on its own and is, is more how people consider you, but you also can't control how other people judge you. Now I can tell you this from personal experience. I've not always been, and I don't consider myself now a great person. I am better than I was five, 10, 15, tw certainly 20 years ago. But there are still people out in this world who look at me today and they can't get around the fact of how I used to be five, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And so they will handle me now through the lens of what they knew me before. And that sucks. I'm trying not to be that person anymore. I'm different. I'm improved. I've, I've, done my best to make as many amends as I can and accept that I'm a person of numerous deep flaws and problems, but I can't always guarantee how somebody's going to judge me. That's on them. And I would love for you to go, no, just look at what I've been doing the last like year, year and a half. But I, I can't suddenly ignore everything that got me here, which not all of it was great. But that's sort of what we accept when we interact with other people. We have the luxury with our work to be able to pull it and conceal it or hide it or let it fade away. But interpersonal relationships don't always do that. It's worth considering why you'd be willing to do it for one thing, but not willing to do it for others. Either commit or don't commit to it. You can't always guarantee how people are going to judge you. You got to be okay with that. But yeah, a business strategy would be pull your old stuff. I don't think you should though. I think you should. It sucks and it was not as good maybe as your, your current stuff or you were younger and you, I don't know, said dumb shit on the internet at the time. I think you got to own it. I think it's to your credit and to your benefit to own up that, hey, you know, when I was younger, even even if we're saying younger was five years ago, I was younger. I did some dumb shit and said some dumb shit. I'm trying to do better now. I think that is way more commendable, way more advantageous professionally, way more honest, just better quality personhood than trying to pretend like, nah, I didn't say that shit. I didn't write those books. No, 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 no. This is, this is my new shit. No, I think you got to own your back catalog in all its forms in addition to your ongoing set. That's just me. Questions? Anybody there in chat? Do we want to hurl Larry in more lockers? Anybody? While I finish more tea? Hmm. 
Anything? Anybody? We good? We gonna keep moving? I'm just quick skimming to see. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, we'll get there. Okay, on we go. Any tips for naming gods? Wow. I'm trying to go for something akin to Robert E. Howard. Okay, Robert E. Howard. Um, we're okay. Well, let's zoom out so I don't only isolate Robert E. Howard. The older style of God naming, and this is gonna go back. Oh God, it's 2020s, so 70 plus years involves two different naming cultures, naming, naming like. Uh, they're not rules. They're, they're constructions. One, you're going to think about a, a name, like an action phrase, like an epithet, like, uh, the God of thunder or, uh, the black goat with a thousand eyes. You're going to, it's a descriptor beyond a name. That's always a safe bet. It's always a safe bet because it gives you a lot of utility for using that God's name. Lord of the Forge, something like that. Just a, a simple descriptor that you can now use as a synonym for whatever proper noun you create. We're going to talk about that in a second. But instead of just calling him like uh, Ted or Larry, the God of Stupid Lightning, you want to call him Larry or the God of Stupid Lightning. That's fine. Sometimes use his whole name, Larry, the God of Stupid Lightning. But mostly the name, depending if we're going for Robert E. Howard, the name's going to come to two parts. One, what the God does, and two, the, the sound of the name creates a level of forcefulness or intensity relative to the God's position. So like a tough God, like Krom, sounds tough. So we're going to find a hard mouth sound or a pair of syllables because not all Robert E. Howard gods have one syllable, we're going to find mouth sounds to, in, to sort of create or suggest a level of force. You know, the evil, the evil ones have a lot of S's and silence and a lot of mysterious tones. You want to get the proper noun there to, to convey some level of emotion in addition to the naming, like the name by utility. Ah, oh, the God of Shadow. That, that, that allows you to kind of shape the overall idea and work back and forth. That's, that's the best thing on God naming I can think of off the top of my head. Nobody ever really asks me for God tips. That's, I'm, I'm thankful. I'm grateful. I love a good challenge, but, um, yeah, that's new for me. I hope that helps. That one kind of threw me. I got to tell you. That question kind of threw me for a loop. I was not expecting that. Um, if you're really, really stuck, go like pull up a list of gods and then use that as a starting point to make your own permutations and creations. Mix and match sounds, see the overall idea and go, oh, okay, so here are the gods I have based on the world building I'm doing. How would I do this in a similar way? But honestly, I think if you focus on utility and then sounds to match uh, emotion, I think you're going to end up really, really happy with things. It's a, good, it's a really good question. Wow, it's surprising. All right. On we go here to question seven. How do I know if my protagonist has enough agency? Agency, just so we're defining it, agency is the ability and potential of a character to make a decision and take action to follow through on that decision in the story. Agency is what every protagonist should have, period, bar none. There are different degrees of agency. Oh, you don't have to apologize for throwing me off my game. It wasn't like the end of the world. It was just a question I wasn't prepared for, and that's the kind of stuff I want to have happen in a chat. Throw me a curveball. Let me think on my feet. Um, you don't, you never have to apologize for that. It was a great question, but I want to come back to this other great question about agency. So agency is the currency, more or less the protagonists spend to move story forward. A character's ability to make choices based on context and, and stuff that's happening and then do something about it is critical for making that character feel connected to the story. So if you have a main character and let's say they're on a, 
uh, let's say they're on like a revenge kind of deal. Like, you know, the bad guys killed my family and now I've, I've got to go kill them kind of a thing. You want to make sure that your character has the ability to do that, that it's not being handled by other people, that it, it kind of takes some difficulty or challenge to go hunt down the bad guys who did the bad guy thing. And they have to work for it because that's what helps the, the reader attach to the character and go, yeah, I hope the good guy kicks some ass. Agency really matters. And we develop agency or we increase agency every time two things happen. One, our character makes a decision. And two, our character acts on that decision in a way relative to the skills and information they have at the time. So let's, let's do some real simple agency building. If I decide to go downstairs to my kitchen and get more tea, that's a decision. Most writers have no problem setting up the decision to make, whether that's in first person or third person or whatever, the thinking part, the non-active part, it's not inactive. It's not active yet. The non-active part is pretty straightforward because you can make that clear with what a character is thinking or feeling or whatever. That's the easy part of agency. The hard part is describing how the character turns the decision into action. Now, sometimes you'll get writers who are great at describing the actions, but the decisions behind those actions are a mess. They're unclear. They're vague. Why is that? Because the character, the writer is not spending enough time with the character's head or in the character's head to explore that space, to make it make sense. Why is the character doing this? The answer should be some decision that we can trace back in the story that, you know, is built on, well, they feel this and they experience this. So feeling plus experience leads to a decision, which leads to action and the story progresses. Your character, your protagonist, has enough agency when they are able to make a decision and take action and the actions they take, more so than the results of those actions. Like if I go downstairs and discover there's a ninja and I have to fight the ninja and that kicks off the story, it's more about my decision to go downstairs and then my follow-up question of what the hell's a ninja doing in my kitchen to help move things forward. When I'm able to make a decision and take action and then the story moves as a result of the actions and decisions I make, I have enough agency. One of the big deal, one of the big issues, the big giant red flags is the idea that the story is sort of happening around the character. Every other character is making decisions and the, the main character is just kind of present. Like, come on, buddy, we're going to go down to the kitchen and fight ninjas. And everybody else is doing the work and I just sort of observe it or I do a very like shallow engagement, like I throw one punch, but somebody else is like fighting, fighting the ninja. There are times and places to have that level of disconnection. There are certain stories that require that. But by and large, agency is your character's own investment in their story. Not just them being busy, because any character can just find stuff to do, but it's having them do stuff relative to decisions they made and the combination of decision plus action advancing the story. Not like an, oh, by the way, since, you know, while you were putting paper in the printer, the rest of the story popped off. You've got to have a, your, your protagonist especially should have a direct hand in moving the story forward. That momentum, that development of ideas is exactly the right amount of agency to move the story forward. It's not like there's a number when it's not like there's a set amount that all action stories have this much agency. It's, it's very, very variable. It's too variable to quantify. But look at your decisions, look at what the character is doing as a result of those decisions, and you will find some level of agency. If you want to increase it, because that's a thing that most frequently happens, characters not only have to take more action, but we've got to spend more time with the decisions, the thinking, and the feelings that lead to that action. It's never just action alone. Really, really important point. On we go. Question eight. Why don't you think book trailers work? It's pretty straightforward. My views on book trailers are, are pretty well known. Uh, and it's pretty much that book trailers are a, a masturbatory waste of time. 
And it's for a very, very simple reason. They try to codify a description of something that is possibly and potentially different than how the reader imagines it. And the book trailer forces a particular set of views or appearances or aesthetics or whatever that robs the reader's ability to create it themselves. And that disconnect, the book trailer says it's like this, but in my head, it's always looked like that, that chasm, that disconnect is, is what makes the book trailer work or not work. It's different than a movie trailer where we have an expectation of seeing a visual, you know, multimedia in our face, visual first material. We don't really have to imagine it so much because it's just, it'll, be, it'll just be on the screen or we've seen some other visual material before, like adapting a comic book or something. But when the story has previously only existed mostly in my brain as a reader, I read the book, I imagined it, the character sounds like this, moves like this. I see this actor in my head when I hear this character talk. And then the trailer comes along and doesn't deliver that for me. I have to try and reconcile those two things because the book trailer, being that the book trailer is mostly produced by the people who made the book, the book trailer is trying to override my imagination. So let's say I pictured a uh, famous celebrity X, but the book trailer gives me famous celebrity Y. If I'm so thrown by that sep that, that difference, I might not engage with the trailer. That's why I think it doesn't work. And the fact that so many trailers default to a kind of uh, frenetic TikTok kind of edit where we're just throwing vibes rather than concrete elements, uh, it creates too loose a structure. Like if I just go princess castle mood harp music and then tell you, oh, it's a romance novel, I'm leaving too many gaps for you to fill in. And if I swing the other way and go, okay, here's the character. This is their name. This is what they do. Here's the conflict, blah, 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 blah. The same way I would in a more structured pitch. I, I'm swinging the pendulum too far the other way and reducing the amount of flexibility you have. It's not even in your interest to engage in any part of this sort of span. Like too far or too weak. It's, it's better off to just organize your pitch and come up with multiple different pitches that allow your reader of that pitch or the listener of that pitch to engage their own mental trailer as opposed to doing that trailer creation for them. Don't do it. And certainly don't like go pay the, what did I see that one lady advertised for? $700. I can think of loads of different ways you can spend $700. None of them are a book trailer, but I don't think they work because they override reader imagination. On we go. Question nine. How can I create excitement in my readers if there's a huge delay between books? Okay, remember that previous question when we were talking about being judged? We're going to have a similar kind of answer here. You can't make them be excited. You can encourage it. Uh, and you can encourage it relative to your own excitement. But you can't like, they're not trained dogs, right? Like we're not Pavlov here ringing a bell and then, you know, reader gets hype. It, it, we, we can build excitement or we can stoke and kindle excitement by focusing on here's the new thing coming, get ready for it, as opposed to pay attention, here's the problem. If we put the focus on a huge delay, if we put, a, uh, we put our focus on the distance between last book and this new one coming. Let's say, I don't know, you're a very famous old fantasy author. So much so that uh, in your book series, it is now a whole point of social commentary as to how fucking long it's taking you to produce the next book. So much so that you, you make a joke about it, no longer at your own expense, mostly just to contribute to it. And it's a reasonable strategy to think that it's possible that you will die before the book is released. It's very hard when you focus on the delay and the gap and the distance. It's very hard to use that as a lever for hype. One of the worst things that I ever saw happen was a book series building to a crescendo and a really frenetic, oh my God, this is great. 
And then there was a, a gap for a number of reasons while the author decided to explore other story avenues. And then, oh, by the way, I guess I got to go back to my main bread and butter when, when those new avenues didn't pan out. And it was really hard to get hype from the new set because it, it, it didn't capitalize fast enough. Don't focus on the delay. Yep, there's been a delay. Okay, we accept it. Treat, don't pretend it's not there, but don't call attention to it. Not in a self-deprecating way. You guys have been waiting long enough. Nah, don't, not, don't even bother with it. Treat it more like, here's the next book. Here's what it is. As if no time had passed. As if we're not really going to call undue extra attention to it. Just go right to, hey, here's the new book. Here are the big things I want you to focus on. This is how we're going to build excitement. Build the excitement or, or base it on what it is, what's there, what could be coming, as opposed to the absence, as opposed to the silence, as opposed to the gap. Focus on what you have, not why you don't have it. It's hard because you're going to want to talk about the elephant in the room, but the elephant in the room is not exciting. Even though we can maybe argue that part of the excitement is that we're done with the elephant, you guys. The gap is over. But how, how many times can you really say the wait is over before everybody's like, Oh, yeah, we get it. The wait is over. Let's go talk about the thing. Just go right to talking about the book. You can't guarantee they'll be excited, but you can do your best to move the conversation towards where you want to go. Good question. Chat. You got any more questions? Are we, are we still, you know, going to bother example wizard Larry or, or any other Questions. I'm I'm ready to get thrown off, man. I'm I'm ready for some wild shit. Let's do it. The worst tea I ever drank was something that tasted kind of like um warm liquid licorice. Not like red cherry or strawberry, but like black oily licorice. It was nasty. Oh, it was awful. I got, I got, and of course they gave me like a big ass cup because, Oh, John likes tea here. Drink this. It was, it was, oh, it was like drinking motor oil. It was terrible. How would I approach writing biblical meaning Christian Bible? Cause B is capitalized biblical commentary. If you are like, if, if you want me to talk about like, here's what I think about, uh, Judea, Nineveh, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. If, if like, here's my view on it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm giving my opinion. If that's the case, then I'm going to frame it just like writing an op-ed, just like writing nonfiction. I'm going to take a stance. I'm going to write it in first person. I'm going to talk about it. Here are my opinions. Here are the facts. Here's my citations. I treat it like a blog post. If you are you don't mean it like that, if you mean like, if you mean what is my overall view on a biblical concept, like my story is an allegory of the Bible, like the Bible has, uh, let me think of one, uh, Cain and Abel. And my story is a lot like Cain and Abel, only I filed the serial numbers off and made it, you know, different. Um, then the commentary I talk about and how I talk about my book isn't so much focused on, Hey, it's Cain and Abel. Hey, it's Cain and Abel. I'll steer it more towards where I want to go. I don't think I've answered your question because I'm not entirely sure I understand the depth of your question. But if you, if you just want to know, like, how do I talk about the Bible in a nonfiction, comfortable voice? Just like I was going to write a blog post, just like I was going to write a newsletter. Hey, I want to talk to you about a thing. This is what the thing is. Here's my view on it. Is that what you're asking? If, I, if, if that's what I'm asking, great. If you mean something else, please let me know. I will give this more detail.
it occurs to me while I sit here that you might also be asking, how do I write something like the Bible in my book? And if that's the case, that's just straight up exposition. That's just tell the story. Okay, you need yeah, think about the questions more. When if it if it pops in your head, let me know. Let me know what you think. I'm happy to answer. Just I need some detail. It's a good question though. You're on you're on the you're on your way to a, a more detailed question. So keep thinking. Ah, oh, you're super welcome. Anytime. Other questions? Else we will march on. Question 10. I got rejected because the agent, the pimp, couldn't, uh, quote, couldn't connect to my main character, end quote. What does that mean? Okay, this comes up in a lot of query letters. And really, this is going to say a couple different things. One, uh, that you're keeping the reader, the pimp in this case, or just the reader in general, at a distance from the story, you're using a lot of detached language. You are not necessarily uh, sharing with the reader what the character is thinking and feeling. Or if you do, you're doing it in a very sort of surface way. Like you're just saying Larry is sad and you're not developing that sadness or explaining why Larry is sad or explaining how Larry expresses sadness. You're just saying Larry is sad in the same way you're saying Oh, there's a cloud in the sky. You're just saying a thing. And that kind of distancing language over a long enough period of time leads any reader, pimp, publisher, or otherwise, to feel like you, the author, don't care enough to give all the details. Like you are just keeping everybody at a distance because, eh, whatever, it's a story, not that big a deal. That's, that's one way people fail to connect with a main character. Second way. What the character does completely strains credulity based on how you've described it. Now, this is going to sound weird because sometimes this happens when we're, we're writing stories that are very clearly big and outside the normal human scope. You're going to write superheroes and science fiction and wizards and knights and people who can turn into fucking birds and all this different stuff that regular human readers can't do. But somehow you're going to tell me that, you know, you're straining credulity. Yes. And that's because you are misunderstanding that it isn't just cool to have a character do stuff. That's cool. No doubt. But if the reader doesn't know how to picture it, if the reader doesn't know how to feel about it, if the reader doesn't get a sense that this is not a boring exercise, like, oh, I can put shoes on. Oh, I can turn into a bird. and It's no big deal. When, when you fail to make something special into something special, the reader has a very hard time at understanding why, just why does this matter? You're doing it so much. This often happens in cases where writers tend to think about the special effects of their story, what would normally be the CG budget, the visual effects budget, and not so much the ramifications of having those special effects exist in the story. Poof, my character turns into a hippo. Oh, okay. Well, why don't they always do that? What, or, or you flip it around. Why do they always have to turn into an animal? When your character operates in a way that the reader cannot relate to, why are they doing what they're doing? Why do they always do those things that they do? Why do they do those things and not some other things? When the character behaves in a way that the reader can has no like ability to go. Yeah. In that situation, I do the same thing. When you fail to build that bridge, nobody's connecting to that main character. doesn't matter if we're talking about uh, a lawyer in a legal thriller. doesn't matter if we're talking about a supernatural character. doesn't matter if we're talking about a, a wizard or whatever else. When the character operates in a way that the reader doesn't feel like if the reader were the character, they do the same thing. You're straining credibility and credulity, believability. Some 
writers overreact when they hear that point and they go, Oh my God, I have to be hyper factual because if I can just explain the rules, the technical stuff, the, the, the name brands, the technical data on the gun and the techno thriller. If I can give you crunchy details to prove to you that I've done my, I'm making air quotes research, then, then somehow you'll connect better with my character. And that's not what I'm talking about at all. Because it has nothing to do with being able to go, oh, that's this brand of whatever. That's this measurement. That's this number. That's this style or type of thing. Anybody can do some extensive Googling or emailing and asking for stuff. And anybody would just, you know, happily, you know, pleasure themselves endlessly showing off how smart they are. But it doesn't matter if you can name check 15 brands and sound authoritative because you're clearly name branding, you know, mentioning names of things that only people in the know use. It doesn't matter. If you can't make the reader feel like they're in the room, if you can't make the reader feel like, yeah, I'm name checking this weird thing, but I'm trying to describe it in a way that feels like you could reach out and touch it. Or if you did touch it, this is what you would experience with your fingers. If you're not going that extra step, it doesn't matter what name checking you're doing. Connecting to your main character is about creating a relationship between who that character is and what that character does and how that character feels with the reader. It is the most important part of developing your story, more than your plot, more than your world building, more than the cool shit that happens in act two. You've got to connect with that reader. You've got to get the reader to feel Okay, this main character might exist outside everything I know. They might be the most murder-happy, special forces, mega cool muscle guy with abs and stubble. And I might just be me, the person who's sitting on their couch on a Saturday afternoon reading this. You're not trying to make the main character and the reader synonymous. You just want to make the main character feel like the reader could conceivably look to their left or look to their right and see this character and feel like, oh yeah, they're a person who exists on planet earth. They live in a completely different world of mine. Like they, they have experiences I never could, but you're explaining them to me in a way that I get. That is the most critical thing. And when you fail to do that in your book, particularly with a pimp in your first 50 or so pages, um, you will get dinged and you will get hit with a rejection letter and a, and a note of, I can't connect to your main character. If you ever need help with that, I spend a lot of time. I, one of the great things I love to do with clients, I spend a lot of time helping build those connections with improving character development or improving your first 20, 30, 40, 50 pages. Head over to johnhelpsyourwritebetter.com, book an appointment, and let's, let's help you not get this rejection letter and let's help you not get this note again. On we go. Question 11. What would lead an agent, a pimp, or a publisher to drop a writer? This does happen. This happens, I can't say it happens a lot, but it happens. There are a couple different factors that would cause a business relationship to be terminated before its time. I cannot possibly begin to list all the possible answers, but let me give you a couple of the biggies. Let me give you a couple of the common ones. First one, first and foremost, sales are low. So there's an expectation, particularly from a publisher, but also from an agent, that uh, when this book goes out into the world, it's going to sell a certain amount. Sometimes your publisher will tell you what that number is specifically. Sometimes they won't. But there's a number. There's almost always a number. And when that number does not get reached... And I'm not talking like they set a goal of 50 and you get to 48. I mean, like they set a goal of 50 and you sell six. When there is very clearly not an audience for your book, despite marketing efforts. I'm not talking like, well, if they just marketed it better, that's a common cop out excuse. When there is no audience, there is no market available for your book. They have no reason to keep trying to throw money at you, hoping to reclaim their advance and pay off this book and make money from it. A publisher's first priority 
is not to be your friend. It's to make money. So when your work is not producing them revenue, customers, etc., they have no reason to keep you. That's a thing that happens. Other th reason. Let's suppose you, hmm, how do I say this? Let's suppose you're a giant racist or an asshole or something, and you decide to jump on social media and just say heinous shit. I don't know. Let's suppose you go on a massive, like, hate-filled, angry meltdown. You hate this people. You hate those people. Here's this bigoted shit. Here's that reason. Here's this problem. Here's this. Here's that. Whatever it might be. You know, really terrible social media behavior. And the existence of that material and the expression of those thoughts make you, as a, as a writer, really just a bad human and difficult to deal with one of the, one of the costs of, of expressing yourself in that bigoted, hateful way is that they don't have to maintain a business relationship with you. Yes. The Mel Gibson special would be a great way of expressing that. Yeah. When you go off on a thing, when you go off on a tear and, and you just turn hateful, racist, prejudiced, bigoted, transphobic, homophobic, your choice of ists and phobics. Yeah. They have every, the hell was that? They have every reason to drop you and should do so quickly as to minimize the damage. Because again, what's their job to make money. And if you are, I don't know, a fascist hate monger, it can be very difficult for your publisher of children's books, for instance, to make money. So item number two, uh, in addition to poor sales, poor humanity, lacking compassion and, and just horrible behavior, they will drop you. How about item number three? They took you on and bit off more than they could chew. Let's suppose that they sign you a pimp or a publisher sign you and the amount of work it would take to get your book into a, a, a position or a quality that they think they could sell, whether they're selling to a publisher as a pimp or whether they're publishing out to the, to the readership. If it would take too long and cost too much and involve too much work that they either can't put in because they have other stuff on their plate or they're unwilling to put in, which happens a lot more than you might think, uh, they'll drop you even though they signed you a deal, even though like they, they thought two, three, four months ago, five weeks ago, whatever, oh, you're the new hot one. This is it. You're going to get it. If it turns out to be an undue amount of work, they will let you go. Why? Say it with me now. Their job is to make money. And if, if you can't put them in a better position to do that, they have no reason to struggle and try to do that. They can always find somebody else. That's what they're counting on. One of the ways you can avoid that in particular is to make sure when you go send your work out into the world for that kind of publishing avenue, you have it in its best shape already. There are other reasons, like let's say you are the 11th client of an agent and they don't have time and space for you, they might drop you because they can't give you any attention. Not even separate entirely from the amount of attention you might be asking for. They might just be really booked and all of a sudden you are one too many kids in the ball pit and just out you go. It happens. Those are the major reasons. Are there others? Yes, but those are the biggies. If, if this leads you to think that, oh my God, publishers and agents are looking for a reason to drop everybody, they're mostly not. It, it takes something outside the normal day to day. It's not like, I don't want to give you the impression that all publishers are constantly looking at their bottom line and then looking at their watch and then saying something to the effect of, well, it's, it's 2 9 PM at the time I'm, I'm saying this. So they haven't sold me a book in since, you know, one thirty. you know, cut them. Not all publishers are like that. Some are. It's worth doing your homework. It's worth, you know, checking this out. But by and large, shitty behavior, poor sales, or just 
poor quality writing will get you dropped. Something to think about. On we go. Question 12. Could a virtual reading work for an unfinished manuscript? So a virtual reading, just in case, you know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you hop on Zoom or you, you, you go live on social media and you read an excerpt from your book, usually to an audience to encourage them to go out and buy the thing. That's the whole point of a reading. Can it work for an unfinished manuscript? I suppose. I don't see why not. The hard part there is the degree of its unfinishedness. Like if, if you're just really proud that you wrote a paragraph in your first draft, that's great. But don't think that because you wrote this one rock solid paragraph on page 27 of your first draft, that the, some reader somewhere is going to like stick around for the one month, two months, six months, year it would take to finish this book, um, or five years or 10 years or however long it takes you to finish the book. Don't assume that because of this one paragraph, one time that you said on TikTok, they're going to stick around. If you're not that far away from finishing and not that far away from trying to move forward publishing wise, I think a virtual reading of your work can help. I think it's a really good tool. I think getting your story out in front of a camera, getting maybe you out in front of a camera over a reader out in front of a camera and, and, you know, giving body and depth to your work beyond just here it is on the page, you know, fucking deal. Uh, I think that can be a huge asset, but if the thing is very rough, your audience is very small and the distance from where you're at to finishing is very significant. I don't think it's a huge asset. Now there's nothing wrong with hopping on social media or whatever and going, okay, I'm going to read you the thing I wrote today. Nothing wrong with doing that. Totally fine. Go for it. But that's not quite a reading. A reading is a, is a, is a different animal. A reading is a sit down, you be my audience. I will now read to you from the thing. And it's this sort of polished, get it ready to go out the door, build some hype thing. But if we are just constantly using social media to keep us countable, Hey, let me tell you what I did today. Da, 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 da. Here are my paragraphs. That's fine. Totally fine. But if you're not ready to move forward, I don't think it's the huge asset that some things on social media are making it out to be. It is fun. Some people do really enjoy the attention. Some people really do love the spotlight. Some people don't. That it is, it is worth pointing out that some people hear about this and go, oh, fuck no. I am definitely one of those animals who's like, oh, give me a microphone and, and some attention. You know, let's go. Other people, though, not. And that's okay. But if you're, if you're nearer, if you're, how do I say this? If you're close to finished, it's great. If not, I would find other avenues to grow your audience, some attention, etc. Shall we finish this sucker up? Question 13. Why do you do what you do? Meaning me. Why do I do what I do? Okay, here you go. Here is, here is a very raw and unvarnished answer. I have worked at several different stages in the pub, in the book publishing world and in the book publishing process. And one of the things that stuck out to me for as long as I've been in here is I've never liked gatekeeping. I've never liked prohibiting somebody and then not telling them why they couldn't get in. Like you're not cool enough to sit here is not a good answer for me. It it's, it's always bothered me that the reason for prohibition should be vague or a form letter. I find that incredibly lazy and I find it counterproductive to the end goal. If the point of traditional publishing is to produce books and sell them, then I, I have always believed since I was 17 years old that the best way to do that is to help people write better books. If you need books to sell, and they have books to write, help them do that. And then everybody wins. And the, the rules about, here's just a rejection letter. Nope, this isn't it. As if you have to guess the magic password or somehow decode the bullshit to figure out why, um, why this is the way that it is. That's not fair. And that's not right. Because 
I, if I never have to tell you the criteria, I can change that criteria and you'd never know. I can move those goalposts forever at my whim. And that's not right. That doesn't help. It's, it's not fun to be a shitty person when somebody's dream is involved. It's not good to be the sort of person who goes out of their way to make life harder for somebody who's being vulnerable. Like that's, that's just shit. Like we should all do better than that. I do what I do because there was a time in my life where I thought the only thing I wanted to do was right. And I tried. I'm not bad at it. I'm better now than if I sat down to do it now, I'd probably be in the best shape to do it that I've ever done it in my life. But I, I tried when I was younger and I did okay. It was very hard. I did not like it. I liked the theory and I liked talking about it. And I was more encouraged by what other people were doing and embarrassed by, by what I was doing because I waited for everybody to just be critical and judgy. Oh, John, you wrote what? How dare you? Like that must suck. Why would you write that? Why don't write this? Why? You know, I was always waiting for the shoe to drop and, and have a negative response. Now I I'm, I'm used to being rejected. I'm used to being turned down. I'm used to loads of people saying, no, it hurts. I've got fairly thick skin in some regard that way, but it's always uncomfortable. And it has always bothered me when it happens because a lot of the time it happens, you don't get that explanation. The goalposts are constantly moved and there's always that guessing game about why, but there's also never any or very seldom any help. It really bothers me when people try to like, nope, that's not good enough, but then they don't take that additional step and go, here's how you get better. In my life, I've had loads of teachers English teachers, professors, literature professors, whatever, experts allegedly in their field tell me all the reasons why something wasn't good enough. I wasn't smart enough, tall enough, uh, rich enough. I was drunk. I was high. I was distracted. I wasn't whatever. I wasn't disciplined enough, whatever. I had very, very few people in my life tell me, okay, that's how you are. Here's how you get better. This is specifically what to practice. This is specifically how to do what you do. Here's how to reach your goal. The people in my life who stopped and took the time, because it's never as long as you might think, but who stopped and had those conversations and had those moments of, here's how you do what you do. You, 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 you want to go from point A to point B? Here, I can't give you the path, but I can tell you how to get there. Like, here's how to, here's how to navigate no matter what happens. Here are the tools you need. Those people always made a better impression on me. And those are the people I respected infinitely more than the people who were all too happy to tell me no or yes with no explanation. When I, when I stopped trying to chase publication, because I was chasing publication because I wanted somebody to like me. It wasn't, it, it's not even a case of like, oh, John wanted another person to like him. No, I, I just wanted the world to think I was good enough. So I chased publication because I wanted to be a big shit famous author because I tried being a big shit famous filmmaker and I got laughed at. I was good, but um, it took a lot of time and effort and I was getting a lot of flack from family so that I, I couldn't pursue that because they didn't respect it. And I really wanted their respect and their praise and writing wasn't much better, but it was at least something I could do with them seeing me. Like, it's hard to explain why I'm up at two o'clock in the morning moving a camera. It's a lot easier to explain why I'm sitting here with a typewriter. When I made it the decision to get away from all of that and say, I want to dedicate my time to helping other people succeed, I definitely didn't get other people saying, oh, that's a brilliant, noble, good Christian thing, young John. I got a lot of like, how is that supposed to help you? Very selfish, very sort of john oriented like how are you supposed to make money doing this how are, and and believe me i'm 46 i'm still struggling the how do i make money doing this question because capitalism will kill us all and i've, I've always been a person buried in self-esteem issues around it but i like helping people it's always made me happy to be a support person to be the, the back row fighter who also periodically heals or off tanks, if we want to use nerd language, right? Like, 
I've always enjoyed seeing people succeed because sometimes that means I succeed too. Like in a team sport. Yeah. I remember the one time the really cool kid in high school threw me a football and I caught a touchdown the one time. But I also liked seeing my friends who were far more physically capable at sports score because it means I won too. I liked seeing people do well. I like being a smart person who can help somebody do well. I like seeing somebody realize that they can get better at something that they thought was previously difficult, even if I'm not the one helping them. Now in my twenties, it was all about, look how smart I am. I can help you. And now in my forties, it's more like, let's just help you. Who gives a shit who, who, you know, it's not about me helping you. It's just about you getting the help. I've always focused on that and more and more so as I've gotten older. I do what I do because I don't think people should have as hard a time being honest and creative at the same time. I think creating art, whether it's a book, whether it's sex work, whether it's painting, whether it's dance, whether it's screenwriting, whether it's whatever. I think when we're making art, we are being vulnerable and emotional and authentically ourselves. And I think we should be promoting that in the same way, you know, 60, 70 years ago, we promoted going to the moon for scientists. Like it, it's how we become better humans and how we do tremendous, incredible things. We, we prioritize not the money, not the success, not the corporation or the capitalism, but we promote ourselves and we, we try to be our best selves and produce stuff that is reflective of our experience and our life and our thinking and our feeling. And every time I have done something to help somebody do that, my life has gotten better, even if it was only for two minutes. And I built a job around that because I like the feeling. <laughs> I, I like feeling good and I like seeing other people feel good too, whether we're talking, you know, purient or impurient or not. I like helping people. I like demystifying the, the, the bullshit. I think more people should be honest. I think more people, I think everybody should be empowered. I think the greatest revolution comes not from, you know, um, efficiency or productivity, but from, uh, acceptance and encouragement. I think the way we change the world isn't to, uh, produce the next widget, but to strip away all those vertical shits and all the goalposts and all the red rope and all the red tape and just be people trying to make the world a better place. And, and I, I'm not very good at making the world a better place except in a few areas. So I've doubled and tripled down on those few areas, like helping people write better. I'm really good at that. I don't consider myself a great teacher. Like if you put me in a classroom, uh, I will get fired by the end of the first day because fuck your rules. But I can explain stuff to you and I can engage with you and I can help make a thing that you had trouble with easier. So I do that. It makes me happy. I think it's important to be happy. It feels good. I think it's important to feel good. That's why I do what I do. Also, the alternatives are really, really depressing for me. I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of other skills that I want to pursue. Um, I get easily bored, easily, painfully bored. I am grumpy. I am difficult. I am very much me. And I, I want to channel that positively as opposed to negatively. So I do this. Thank you for your question. You want to get out of here? Are there any other questions from anybody here? Shall we go? Yeah, let's go. Ladies, gentlemen, guys, gals, non-binary pals, thank you. Thank you for being here today. 
Thank you for your awesome questions. Thanks for helping me, like getting me to think about how to name a God. Thanks for letting me talk about me for a hot second. Thanks for asking me loads of great stuff. Thank you for your questions. Thanks for your time, your focus, your attention. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. It means the world. Now, the next time I'm here in your eyes and in your ears will be uh, the 27th. If you're looking for the next writer's chat, but if you just want to get me in your ears every day, uh, go wherever you get your pods casted and go look for John helps you write better. And I will be there pretty much Monday to Thursday, all week, every week, helping you with writing advice, answering questions and doing loads of different kinds of stuff. Beyond that, if you want help with your work, whatever it is, no matter how you want to do it, head over to John helps you write better book a free, yeah, free appointment. And I'll help you do whatever you want to do. Costs you nothing. Only takes 30 minutes. Might be worth your time. And if you want to support anything and everything I do, whether that's uh, watch movies, write better, the project on Patreon, whether that's, you know, making sure there's more chats, whether that's just making sure I have plenty of tea, head over to patreon.com forward slash John helps you write better. And if you're watching this on YouTube in the future, please feel free to like and subscribe and click the little button and uh, do all the YouTube bits because they really do make a difference. So until the next time we talk until the next time I'm in your eyes and in your ears, thank you. Thanks for being here. And I will talk to you super, super soon. See ya.